I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about object permanence and ADHD. Idea being circulated that people with ADHD have problems with object permanence, and object permanence, our discussion is failing to understand or believe that an object is continuing to exist when it's no longer in direct perception by your senses, when you're no longer hearing, seeing, smelling, or tasting it. Common examples, a patient was recently telling me that her husband was pushing her to clean the garage. She actually likes to keep it messy because when everything's out, everything's all over the place, everything is findable, it's searchable. And when her husband, who's good and organized and tucks everything away in jars and drawers and cabinets, then she can't find anything. It's not that it's in a different place than she left it, which may be part of it. It's that she can't see it. So when it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Or I had a mother who was talking an anecdote with her son who was trying to do his math homework. And she said, where's his, where's your math book? I don't know. No idea. How are you going to do your math problems without it? I'm not sure. Well, have you looked for it? No. So it's sort of with this kid, even though he could conceptually get that he needed his math book to do the homework, if it wasn't in his visual presence, if it wasn't around, it was gone. He had no idea. And even the thought of looking for it didn't occur to him. Or another person was complaining about her boyfriend who takes his clothes off, sweatshirt, other stuff, just leaves them on the floor, steps around it for the next two, three, four days, as if there's no awareness that there's a pile of clothes on the floor that should be in the hamper or in the washing machine. Teacher commenting on some of the kids in a class during lunch hour that once they unwrap the candy wrapper and the wrapper just falls from their hand, kids' hands, and they don't seem to have any apparent awareness connection. So there's you know, a trail of debris or clutter following beyond. It's not that the kid's intentionally throwing it on the ground and littering or you know, missing the trash can. Another patient is describing doing the laundry and carrying up the, from the laundry room the hamper of clothes, putting it on the bed, starting to sort it, and then got a text from a friend, got distracted, and five hours went by where there was not a single thought of you know, getting back to putting the clothes until he went to bed and couldn't get into bed because there were clothes on. Numerous patients of mine with ADHD have said, my God, you know, I just went to the dentist and he reminded me I haven't been brushing my teeth for the last five or six months. I mean, I've seen some people with depression who avoided that self-help care, but I've seen it really frequently in people who are, you know, functional working adults with ADHD, but you know, teeth, you don't see them. They're sort of, it's a hassle or a chore. It's not terribly interesting or rewarding in the short term to brush your teeth. Popular press have talked about emotional object permanence, where if you don't hear from your friends for a few days or weeks, the sense that if you don't hear from them, they must have stopped caring about you. People describing if they're feeling numb at a funeral, that means that the death doesn't really register because the person is no longer there. It, it doesn't seem as real to you. I think some of these um, things that have been trotted out as signs of the emotional object permanence fit much more closely with some of our personality disorders, narcissistic personality disorder, or borderline personality disorder, rather than with ADHD per se, but I've seen all these talked about. So getting back to Jean-Pierre Piaget, not quite a hundred years ago, studied infants and how they developed their concept of how the world works and how brains work. So he defined object permanence as young infants, he would say, believe that an object doesn't exist once it's out of sight, out of mind, out of sensory perception, and that it takes active work interacting with things, and he believed that the motor activity, being engaged with your world, was an important aspect of gaining object permanence, and that this gaining it isn't just a sudden it clicks in or on. It's a process, so it's not all or none. So at some age, if you put a towel over half of a clock or half of a toy truck, if it will still act as if they understand that the whole truck is behind that, Whereas at that same age, if you completely cover it with a the towel, they won't act as if the 
objectives there at all. So again, this is something that comes on gradually rather than all at once. For most kids, it seems to develop around the age of 8 to 12 months, but there's some other ways of testing supposedly object permanence, which suggests there's at least some features in it that may be in place months earlier. Piaget himself sort of believed that this was pretty purely a neurological, biological unfolding of innate processes in the human brain, and that culture had very little to do with it. More recent cross-cultural studies suggest there are differences in terms of how different cultures treat and understand and work with objects in their environment. Part of the problem with our whole idea of object permanence and how it unfolds or develops is that we're testing nonverbal kids or kids who are just learning to talk. 12 months, not too many kids are saying much that's going to be that informative. So most of the inferences are drawn from attention, whereas a little infant baby attending to, so the assumption is if they're watching a shiny red ball and they like that, and then you put a towel over it, and the youngest kid sort of instant, instantly just lose interest. It's as if it's gone. The assumption is that their concept of it is gone. Slightly older age, when you put the towel over it, they develop sort of some frustration or agitation, which again suggests that they think some amount that something is still existing or something could still be existing. And then at a later stage, when they can point to where they think it is or keep fixated on the object, either where it was before it was covered or if it was a moving object where the trajectory of that would be carrying it, our inference is they are understanding the object is still there and continuing even though they can't see it. So again, all of this is inference based and work has been done on other animals other than humans. So there's certainly studies looking at some smart birds, like birds in the crow family, ravens, crows, seem to develop some fairly sophisticated notion of object permanence. So if you could cover a seed or a peanut, they can know that it's still under that bowl rather than the mother bowl. Dogs and cats also seem to have some rudimentary ability to figure out Object permanence. Dogs are better at this than cats. Sorry, cat lovers are better at several dimensions that have been looked at. And people often sort of play around with throwing a ball to their dog. And then what does a dog do if you don't let go of the ball? Does a dog understand that if it didn't wind up out there in the field, it might still be in your hand or not? So one of my problems with using all the previous ADD examples and describing them as object permanence, I think we're talking about a slight, I think all those were examples of out of sight, out of mind. And when we're talking about object permanence, we're saying that that infant or that dog or cat or a frog really does not have any conception or understanding that the object exists once they're no longer perceiving it. With ADHD, we're not saying the person doesn't understand it still exists. We're just saying it's not in their awareness. I think that's a pretty important distinction. So I think although the concept of object permanence overlaps closely with out of sight, out of mind, I do think that they are distinct phenomena or processes or levels of brain working or processing or understanding. And I think it's misleading when we use a, you know, a term that has a fairly specific meaning like object permanence and transfer it over to sort of more colloquial use. So I would urge people, you may sound less sophisticated, but I would encourage people to use out of sight, out of mind for this host of ADHD traits rather than saying that there's failure of object permanence. Because these people, I mean, if you ask them, they know that their school book really exists somewhere or that that wrench they're looking for in the garage somewhere is in one of those drawers. They're not saying it's failed to exist saying, I don't know, and if I'm not being reminded, I'm going to forget to not keep it in consciousness. So that's all I have to say for today. I will be disappearing myself, so my object permanence will be impermanent. 